and it's a little notepad and I titled it in the first page it says things I'm going to change when I'm a boss and I've been making lists for years on like bad bosses I've had or leadership that may not have been leadership the way that I had done it and I've been making those notes for years and accumulating a little notepad and so I just want kids to know that you know there are people like me out there willing to change and 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 go against the curve because times are changing whether we like it to beyond the ball podcast what's going on what's going on what's going on ballers and welcome to another episode of the beyond the ball podcast I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and as you all know, the focus of this show is ultimately to help student athletes succeed beyond their degree, and we focus on doing that by sharing stories, strategies, and successes from various guests from all over the world, just very interesting individuals, and if you have not taken the time to subscribe to the podcast by way of our YouTube channel, I would encourage you to just do that. Go on YouTube, type in Jonathan Jones Speaks, and then subscribe to the platform. But without further ado, I'm ready to bring out today's guest, ready to bring out my my my, my guy, man. We we connected some time ago and and then it was it was just, you know, it was like sparks fly and everything like that. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and welcome out my man, Mr. Tay Hawker. Tay, how we doing? We are doing good. Thank you so much. How you doing? I'm 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 good. I'm I'm good. Tay, and and, and like like I told you before we, you know, before we hopped in, I said I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna try to attempt to to hit on all of what you do. So I'm gonna kick it to you now, and I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's a, uh, it's definitely been a a long ride over the last. Uh, I, it's it's been a long ride all through coming to America and everything. So, um, I've had to do the introduction thing a few times because uh, it does get pretty diverse. A uh, bit of a crazy story, but my name's Tay. Uh, currently, I am. Uh, the coordinator of student athlete development at Old Dominion University, um, and I, I'm chairing the NIL task force there as well. So, um, really excited for the for the future of college athletics. But before that, I'll do a quick run through. But uh, originally born and raised in New Zealand, um, played a handful of sports throughout my life. But rugby kind of became my uh, vessel, I guess you'd say. I've always wanted to work in uh, the American sports industry since I was very little. Uh, I, it's hard to put an exact pinpoint on why, um, but I think America does it better than any other country. Not not necessarily fiscally when you look at what European football ha- has become, but um, as far as opportunities um, and, and limelight, et cetera, the glitz and the glam, I think the American sports industry does it best. So uh, I've always wanted to come here and then uh, I got the opportunity to play college rugby at Lindenwood University. It's a D1 institution in St. Louis, Missouri. So I uh, took that opportunity, uh, ran with it, was very fortunate to be a student athlete, but uniquely it's not an NCAA sport, so we didn't have the protections that the NCAA provides um, and, and all that. So I kind of had to figure out the hard side of being a student athlete in a club sport, but still be D1. Um, mm-hmm. So I went through that, graduated uh, with a, a sports management degree and a minor in political science. Um, and then I, while I was doing that, I worked for the Rams briefly. I'll, I'll jump through these work for the Rams while I was there, then the blues, uh, ice hockey, then graduated, went to Los Angeles, worked for the LA Clippers, um, and then had to go back to school because I'm a bit foreign. It's pretty difficult to get a visa. So I went back and got a master's at, uh, Arizona state university, got my master's in sports law and business. Um, while I was there, I worked for the athletic department and student athlete development, fell in love with that industry. And at the same time was, uh, up in, uh, Peoria, Arizona with the Texas Rangers and the farm system just helping. Oh, it was a volunteer type role. But so I managed to touch all four major sports in the NCAA, which is which is my pickup line when I meet a, a pretty girl at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> so what so so of all of those, well, let me let me not even go there yet. Well, I'll just, I'll just ask it. I'll just ask it. So of all of those, like what what would you say you like you learn? Well, first let me ask you. I'm I'm just so I'm just I'm just blown away because just how you listed off that <clears throat> but going back and ma- first of all making the making the decision to bounce around to those areas like what is it that you took away from those experiences let me ask you that 
Yeah, it, there was a lot of learning curves with it. And I'll say like when I look at my resume and I've asked this to a lot of my mentors, I've said, um, is it bad that I've been in, in too many different fields? Because each one was also in a different department. Um, and so like I've done sponsorship, scouting, I've done sales, uh, business development. And it's because my visa requirements meant that like when I was with the Rams, I was on a CPT, which is uh, had to be within my major and, and it was for class credit. And then they obviously went to LA. So that's why I had to stop working for them because it was the St. Louis Rams. But then with the Blues, I was on a I was a volunteer because I wasn't allowed to get paid. Um, and then I went into an OPT. So I had to work within a certain period of time and then that expired. So I had to go. So basically what I'm saying is like my, re my resume jumps around, but it's because I had uh, a lot of hurdles to jump. So what did it teach me uh, to be extremely resilient? And um, I couldn't have a chip on my shoulder because I saw all my friends as Americans just be able to work whenever for however long for however much money um i couldn't ha hold that resentment with me because i chose this path and it was always going to be more difficult um to kind of be within those restrictions but then still have a and as you know a very specialist industry where sports is hard this is no joke to oh be successful in sports so um i had that it was a difficult industry and a lot of visa regulations that i had to abide by so uh, I guess it taught me not to carry the resentment with me and just focus on Tay's track and the fact that other people may have had it easier in that aspect had nothing to do with me and good for them. I'm, I'm jealous of them and I had jealousy, but uh, it was character building for me. So I always looking for a silver lining is, is definitely a big lesson. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, what, what you said couldn't be more true because... I feel that depending on at every level, like there, there are certain gatekeepers or or it's more so like the sports community is like a family mm -hmm. and the sports community is very protective of their loved ones or their siblings. It's like, no, we're not going to let you in here. So you really do have to be very intentional about, you know, the people that you connect with, the jobs that you have, if you even get the opportunity. Right. Because yeah. it's very difficult to get into the realm of sport because it, it's sexy. Everybody mm. wants to work in sports yeah. and you see people on TV and it's just exciting. But yeah, man, I mean, I've even seen some of that myself, but that's another conversation for another day. Oh, for sure. We'll wait till we're off air and, and dig into that <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So rugby. So how, what, what was your how did you decide to go with rugby? What was it based on you, you know, being being born and brought up in New Zealand or talk, talk a little bit about that? Because. Yeah, you know, rugby is, is is interesting to me. Yeah, it's it, rugby is is everything to us in New Zealand. It's our absolute culture. Um, and I played like I was in basketball. I did a little bit of cricket. Rowing was really big. Um, I, I ran track, swam, you know, in like a, you name it. But rugby was that one that kind of stood out to me as being um, my. It was in my blood. Uh, it made sense. Um, so I obviously chose it to to use to go to my next vessel because I was playing at a high level in New Zealand as well. But I knew I wasn't going to be like the LeBron James of rugby or anything. It was it was a means to an end. Um, but it, I was passionate about it and I, I did enjoy it. Um, but I knew where my career lay and, and that was in, in sports business. So um, I did. I went to Lindenwood in hopes of, you know, catapulting me into sports. But when I got there, and this is a big conversation too is that i got recruited in 2012 and so uh technology's changed a lot i didn't i hadn't been to campus i hadn't i had facebook messaged a couple of the guys but i there was no instagram account of the team there were like youtube videos didn't really exist i didn't really know what i was getting into but i knew i wanted to go to america so um i went there because the american rugby team or like what i thought the american rugby league wasn't very good um, because like it's not their main sport, which is fine. So in my head, I was coming to America to do sports business and then just dominate at rugby. And then I got there and man, I got woken up really quickly. It was like my first day of practice. I was like, oh my gosh, these you guys can play. Like it was, I, I got a, a rude awakening very quickly. My ego was checked and I was like, okay, so if I'm coming to Lindenwood, I gotta, I gotta be here to play. So that was definitely difficult to transition out of this you know i was sports business sports business and then i was like oh i've, I've got to try or else i'm just going to get left behind so i was in the gym i was eating right and then had to be, like dive back into rugby but in my head when i was leaving new zealand i was like my rugby career is over i'll i'll casually play a bit of 
rugby in america but then when i got here i was like, oh these guys mean business and that and it really was a good testament to um the culture of american sports and how um if you play in college any sport that i'm not gonna you know do a comparison game because i'll insult one sport but if you come here for any sport if you're going to college you got to be ready to play because it, it's no joke mm. it, ncaa or not you know so um there was it was really cool to kind of get that experience too and and uh kind of get slapped around and be like oh okay I, these guys know what they're doing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think a, a lot of times it, it, it can be easy to underestimate how competitive college athletics can be. And just like you said, at, at whatever level, any sport at whatever level, because this is this is still an elite level, especially right before, you know, like like your pro and different things like that. But what, what was what was the culture shift like going from New Zealand to coming over here to the States? Yeah, it, this is a good question because people are like, did you have a culture shock? And I don't think I had a culture shock um, because everything that I, the differences that I noticed came out over like time. And the biggest one has been in my career, um, like work, getting into the workplace. New Zealand is a very, for better or worse, a very laid back country. Um, we aren't bothered by too much. We're very relaxed. Uh, it's hard to get under our skin, which is a good thing, sure. But the American culture of how hard people are willing to get after it and work and be focused in their craft um, and and a little and for sure more high strung, but not in a bad way if that makes sense. It, it's it, it has been something that I've I've adapted to over time. Um, I always tell my friends here and back home that I was I, I'm more aligned to this uh, lifestyle because I am extremely hungry and and dedicated to my craft. Um, not to say like New Zealanders aren't in an aspect, but um, it, it stood out to me a lot on Easter because it was Easter Friday and my mom was like, oh, what are you doing for Easter Friday? And I was like, working. She's like, you're, wor you're working on Easter Friday? And I was like, yeah, we got we to gotta work. And mom was like, that's a holiday. You're meant to be at home. And I'm like, no, in America, like you work through these. Like there's a lot more national holidays and a lot more balance in life um, back home and, and that like social aspect. It's, they take a lot of time off. PTO is you get a massive amount of PTO. Maternity leave and paternity leave is massive, um, but here it's you're you're a lot more um, work orientated, I should say. And like I said, it's for better or worse on both sides. Um, <laughs> and so I, I mean, I do love it here, and and that element that you know we are expected to work very hard. I never had any issues with going into sport. You know, I've worked for free for months and months and months, um, years accumulating years i've worked for free and diff with different teams or um departments and everything and i never had a problem with that it's just the way it is um however a whole different argument is i think we are going to lose a lot of the next generation um of talented people and especially college athletics um because we are pushing that narrative what i think might be too hard and you know scaring off some of those the the younger generation um i was just fortunate that i didn't bat an eye at it my but to kind of um, be a little bit hypocritical and um, I've, the words lost on me, but I'm going to sound like I'm going back on what I just said. My parents are extremely hard workers. And so uh, they, I've never really batted an eye at hard work. I've, if I ever complained about work to my parents, I would have got laughed at. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, w it was good for me going through all those GA positions and internships and volunteerships because it, it wasn't any major deal to me. I just didn't think anything of it at the time. Um, but I am seeing a lot of young people in college athletics leave because other industries are offering them three or four times more money um, and and an actual work balance. So, yeah, it's it, that's going to be tough going forward. And I definitely hope to play a role um, as I climb the ranks within college athletics to play a role in providing um necessary welfare to our young interns and gas and everything um but yeah, it's, a, it's a long long answer to, to discuss the the comparisons <laughs> no 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 it's, it's, it's fine this, this is good this is good and that's one thing i've been i've been curious about as well because i mean i know that i really just started looking around and, and, and started getting my feet wet just in the college athletic space <clears throat> primarily last year 
And then now we're a year later for me, right? For me, I'm looking around. I'm like, oh, wow, this person's leaving athletics. This is a person in seniority position. They're leaving athletics. And, and I'm just trying to figure it out because athletics is generating revenue. Well, for the most part, depending on the institution we're talking about. But either way, athletics is typically generating revenue to either help out with, with the school or help out in whatever industry. So I don't know. I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just watching and I'm like, I want, were this many people leaving last year that I just didn't know? It, it's it is it i would say it's been happening for a while i think the pandemic might have um illuminated some other opportunities for other people uh to want to leave that the industry um you know when you get taken away from, because the perks of being in college athletics is being in that environment you know we love mm -hmm. college athletics for a reason um so when you told us in march of last year that we had to go home then we didn't have the interaction with student athletes. We weren't at the games. We weren't seeing their wins and their losses in person. We were just at home. Um, and I think that kind of made people sit back and be like, what do I really want to do? Um, and then the other part of it is, and I get this all the time because of my friend, sir, like my, so like my friend circle, I'm probably one of the only ones on, uh, within college athletics, everyone else is kind of doing, whether it be like recruiting or sales, um, few of my friends in uh, digital marketing and things like that and they're all on far better money than I am and like it, it's different for me to sit there and listen to their stories and they're buying homes and, and new cars and getting whatever they want my best friend just decked out his home gym and it's incredible I'm like in my head I'm like I could never pull this together and but granted I've got a school on, I've got a gym on campus I can use whenever I want so there are there are perks um that may not be financial, but at the same time, when you took all of that away, I think some people sat back and be like, why am I busting my ass for a quarter of what my friends are making at this, at like this, you know, mid to late twenties stage in your life. Um, so it, it's a hard decision. And this is something that I talk about all the time as well to my mates, but everyone who's successful in, in sports, uh, or sorry, I should put it the other way around. Everyone who's at the later stage of their career in sports are all making money like no one's making average money and then above the age of like 50 so if you can what i say is like if you can make it there if you can hang through all this stuff till you get to like 50 uh, and that's just a loose age but like to the later end of your career you will make money the money's there but there's this like disparity between the drop off and some people i think are, are looking at that and saying you know, I'm not going to put in for 20 years, 30 years, and then like maybe because my theory might be wrong, but they put in all that work and then next minute they're like, I could have been making this much somewhere else and, and not being in sports. So mm. it's hard because, you know, we are in that lifestyle where we see all of our friends do it now. We're on Instagram, we're on uh, TikTok, we're on Snapchat. We, we see it every day. So we kind of have to play that pros and cons game it's 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 tough and i like you said you we are losing people daily um whether it be to entrepreneurial jobs or just um going into different fields and it's a damn shame because it's an incredible career um we just have to be treating the the next generation um with a bit more care i would say mm. so if so if you could just give a word of encouragement to the next generation, you know, somebody who, who who just got their first GA internship or somebody who just got started in, you know, their 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 green, I believe is the term that that people use when when you're fresh or when you're new. Like what what like what would you tell tell that individual who's just getting started, just getting their feet wet, just getting in the door? I would say change is coming um in, and to hang in there i i like myself i've just gone into one of my first full-time roles but i'm very early into my full-time kind of capacity in the in the sports field um and i'm a huge advocate for changing it so when the going gets tough for those those kids and it will um you know know that there is going to be a change coming because it's not sustainable um to to carry on the way we are in, in that element um like you know join me help me change um another thing i've it's not surprisingly not with me but i have a little notepad that i started back when i was probably 19 
and it's a little notepad and I titled it in the first page. It says things I'm going to change when I'm a boss. And I've been making lists for years on like bad bosses I've had or leadership that may not have been leadership the way that I had done it. And I've been making those notes for years and accumulating a little notepad. And so I just want kids to know that, you know, there are people like me out there willing to change and, and, and go against the curve because times are changing, whether we like it or not, we've had the most interesting time in all of our lives over the last 12 months. And we have to be ready for change and be willing to change, be adaptable. And so I would, I would just tell the kids that it, like change is coming. We'll be fine. We'll, we'll get through it because like anything, if we want to survive, we have to be malleable and, and ready to uh, ride that roller coaster change. Yeah. That sounds like, um, sounds like you got a book going on over there. You know, you just, 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 just put it together and then, you know, just give it to, you know, the higher ups and just all across the country, just, Change is going to come. That's the name of the book. Or these are things I would change if I was the boss. Yeah. We, we've all had bad bosses though, right? Like you, you've always got things that are like, oh, I wouldn't do that if I was a boss. And the hardest thing to remember and not to get carried away on it, but the hardest thing to remember is you're not in your boss's shoes. Um, and that's what I've had to keep reminding myself because like when I was an intern and the boss, 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 like a super important person may have either not given me the credit that I thought I deserved at the time or um you know didn't say hi to me in the hallway or little things that are, play a huge role on a young intern's life but the other side of the coin you have to remember is that a the boss is dealing with far bigger things than saying hi to the intern in the hallway um they, like their job might be on the line that day too um you, you don't know what that boss is dealing with too that you you always think you're the most important person in your life because you are but mm. sometimes you you kind of have to remember uh you know it's not always and i've i've kind of had to check myself a few times because i've been like that was rude but then you've got to put yourself in their shoes and be like they probably weren't being intentional they might have been rushing to a meeting or well, you don't know what it is so that's the other side of the coin that i always preface that uh statement with fair enough fair enough so talking about change and talking about higher ups and talking about bosses i want to take a slight pivot and I, I want to talk about j just uh, your, your work and your, your role being being the co-chair of of the NIL task force. Talk, talk a little bit about that, Tay. Like, what, what do you do in that role and what, what that looks like for you? Yeah, this is my most ex if you thought I talked a lot now uh, before this, <laughs> this is my this is my most exciting topic. Um, yeah. So basically, we are looking to be at the forefront of name, image and likeness. Um, I think there's been some schools that have done great jobs of um, of being at the forefront also, but the issue with that is you could take a step too far in this field because the rules have not been made yet, whether we mm -hmm. like it or not. And so we're preparing to play a sport where nobody knows the rules of the sport. So that that's the best analogy that I've got is like we're, we're in the gym getting ready and we don't know whether we need the bench press or we need uh, more game plan or whatever. Like we're trying to prep for a game that we don't even know how the game's played. So um, there's been some moves in the country that I've seen come across D1 Ticker or my Twitter or whatever it might be. And I'm thinking, uh, I think you might be a little premature on that one. But uh, <laughs> for what I'm trying to do is prepare um, accordingly and be patient and calculated uh, and any partnerships that we may get into. Um, that's obviously been advice from leadership also. Um, but as the chair, um, I'm working with some incredible people at ODU, just making sure that we're, A, protecting our student athletes. That's always going to be first and foremost, um, making sure they're the happiest kids they can be and, and the most successful kids they can be. That's always going to be number one on our priorities. And then uh, a close second is protecting ourselves as an institution. Um, and making sure that we're doing everything right also but like i said it's hard to prep for that when um we don't know the rules yet so <laughs> waiting on the rules very 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 difficult to to do and and that's why i've been so just what's the word i want to use I, I guess that that's why i've been so confused J just just seeing so many like panel discussions and seeing so many because at, at this point, of course, you know, there's the updates that come out here and there 
every every once in a while, just like you were saying, according to like the ticker and stuff like that. But at one point, it was it was different people having the same exact conversation. It's what it seemed like for me. And I'm like, well, what are we what, what are we talking about? We're talking about what ifs. Mm. We're, we're having whole conversations and whole panels and whole discussions around what this thing could be and what that does look like. But uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to really just just ask you that because. I've noticed you you started doing something with, with TikTok. Talk a little mm. bit about that, Tay. Talk a little bit about what, what you've been doing with TikTok, man. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm, I will acknowledge I'm too old for TikTok, but <laughs> um, but within saying that, and your TikTok does does the same thing, and and I'll get to what what I decided to do, and I think you you're doing the exact same thing. But I was in a position where I was getting student athletes reaching out to me from all over the country. Um, from different schools I'd worked at or family, friends, et cetera. And they were kind of either asking me about the NIL or I was like FaceTiming them and be like, yo, are you ready for NIL? Like, have you been thought, thinking about some stuff? And they're like, the, the what? And I've I've had kids be like, oh, that's the schools are going to pay us to play football, right? And I'm like, no, that's not what's going to happen. Um, and so I've had to, I, and these conversations, I was teaching student athletes and I realized that schools have not been educating these kids on NIL. No school, like power five, group of five, D2, whatever it might be. No one's been telling these kids anything. And so what I wanted to do was start teaching the kids about some of the opportunities. And it doesn't need to just be like, don't do this, don't do that. You're going to get in trouble if you do this. But here's some creative ideas of what you could do. And um, there are going to be some rules. And around these rules, here's some opportunities. Now, the best place to go speak to the kids is where the kids are all hanging out. And so instead of going to the mall back in 08, we have to go to TikTok <laughs> now um, and to communicate with the student athletes. And that's what I've did. I did is I'm making at the moment just like one minute videos um, on, you know, different elements, whether it be like autographs or um, what, what relationship you can have with agents or what uh, you can do, what can you sell, what you can't sell, what a sponsorship deal is going to look like, what are endorsements, um, how do you pay your taxes on those little bits of information that I know these massive companies are looking at doing for, through the schools. But I figured like I'm going to jump on it now and, and start teaching some student athletes as to what, what they can and can't do. Um, and more, I want to be positive about it because it is exciting for them and I, and I want them to be excited about it too. Um, but I also, I tweeted the other day and said, we need to start educating the kids too. Cause some of the things that they've said to me, like I've got DMS on Instagram and stuff and, They've asked if they could do things, and I'm lucky they've asked because I've been able to say no. But uh, they they're definitely getting carried away with some of the narratives from people. Is all I'm going to say. I'm not throwing anyone under the bus. But people have been creating a narrative that they might might be able to do a lot more than what they're actually going to be able to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think education definitely is is the piece that really does need to take place because. For one, j just just having well, first of all, just managing expectations, because if you were somebody who was like me, I was Division three uh, basketball and I was the guy who was closer to the back end of the bench, more so closer to the front. So understanding that, like being realistic, if if I if I was playing, I probably didn't have the amount of earning potential as a Jalen Suggs. Mm -hmm. Period. So we have to we have to understand, first of all, just like you said, Tay, we have to understand what are the rules that we're currently looking at and then where are the opportunities? So mm -hmm. that's why I really I really want to talk to you about that, because I'm grateful that you are taking the time to educate and taking the time to inform and then also letting them know you might not want to do this. You might want to do that. You know, mm -hmm. just just ultimately, because I think without the education piece. We hear NIL, we think money, and then we just try to do whatever we can do to capitalize on NIL. But NIL isn't even here yet. Mm. So I think I think that's the part. It's, it's just so it's so dangerous to me. It's so dangerous. But just like you said, I, I think it is something to be excited about. Mm. But I think it's something that we have to be very, very, very intentional on what's being put out there. And then ultimately making sure that these, these young student athletes that, that they have the information that they need to make the educated decisions. Yeah. I, I'm an absolute believer of um, you're only as smart as your group that you surround yourself in. And so I try to surround myself in really intelligent people. And I've spoken to a lot of people um, 
both political figures and lawyers, etc., about NIL um, and got their thoughts on it. And the mo from the people who I believe are the most intelligent, the most common feedback is that it's going to be a whole lot of nothing. And that's direct quotes um, mm. because uh, there's always, there is going to be your, and if you talk numbers, maybe 20 to 50 student athletes that hold true like shocking value in in nil like like hundreds of thousands of dollars um and you know who they are every year it's it's the people who are running for a heisman uh and then you know it's your top 20 college at, uh, basketball players etc but it, let's say it's under 100 just to be um i, I would say it's 100 er, you know under 100 um and so you have to be really careful that we don't get caught up in the glitz of glam of college athletes can make money in this there is 360 or thousand that you know make up that population but they don't hold that much brand value that you know someone who isn't a college athlete uh, you know holds the same value in that aspect whether you're mm -hmm. a, like it, there's not as much value as i think people are getting excited for and i don't want kids that don't hold much value to be overexcited about this because some company like I've, I'm seeing a ton of companies on Instagram um, doing projected values and and all this on on a college athlete, and it's it's quite frankly heartbreaking for two reasons. Firstly, po possibly incorrect, probably incorrect, and then secondly, you can't like you're using words like value, and I'm a, a student athlete welfare guy. Like I care about the well being of student athletes, and I would hate for them to start putting value on themselves in a numerical figure it, the, it's not real it's just mm -hmm. a projection it, and and on top of that you don't value yourself on how much money you can make for a company so like if if athlete x is friends with athlete y and athlete x is valued at a higher rate than athlete y what's stopping athlete y from not feeling worse about themselves because why aren't i valued more like you, you're talking about a mental health issue here too um and that concerns me and and to kind of build on that a little bit is we our entire lives we've been kind of programmed to get rewarded for what we put in we uh we grind on the court we we grind in the locker room we grind in the in the weight room and become good athletes and then get game time as a result and you do good game you play well when you get game time you get awards and and scholarships etc now we're looking at um, and I'm going to use an analogy just to, to help uh, this, but I hope I don't offend anyone in, in the analogy. But like, let's talk volleyball, for example. You could be the starting player on that volleyball team, um, number one recruit out of high school, the, the volleyball player. And then you could have a, a girl on the bench who, you know, gets a couple of minutes, um, he, you know, in a game maybe. And, and she doesn't really produce much, but the, the number one recruit might not be as attractive as that bench player. And now you, you, you're facing this problem where the bench player can be making a ton of money realistically based off their looks alone um, through social media and, and endorsements mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. things like that. And then this number one recruit is going to have to figure out or wire themselves to understand that like, yeah, you get game time, but then the, the bench player might be rolling up in a new Mercedes to practice <laughs> and you're going... Like I've been busting my like, and yeah, I know I'm reaching on them. You're probably not going to get a Mercedes anytime soon through NIL money, but let's pretend like you could blow up. We, you do look at tens of thousands of dollars for a post on Instagram. If you're over a million uh, followers. Um, so realistically, if you did get there, if you were Insta famous, quote unquote, you could get to that point. And now you've got to rewire athletes to be like, yeah, you're really good at your sport, but now and and you don't see that in anything else because like in the nfl you get paid for how good you are at your sport and across mm -hmm. all the other leagues it, it carries over but now it's on your brand image and how you carry yourself on on socials or in in person how you can uh get the roi on your name image and likeness and no longer sure being good at your sport certainly helps in an element but it's all about roi now if you look at if you talk with influencer marketers um they want people that are going to bring return to their business so um if that might not in some of those non-revenue generating sports they not, might not necessarily be bring, bringing in a whole lot of money for the business because they're good at volleyball but if they are stunning and knows how to edit their photos or take good pictures then they can and and i think that's a huge mental health issue that i i pray student athlete development uh, professionals are, are preparing for um 
because I don't know how to, I'm not a, a counselor or a therapist of any kind. I don't know how to address that issue. Um, but it, it's an issue that it can, can certainly happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, 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 it's, it's so much going on. To, and just like we were talking about before, it's, you know, people are rolling out the idea projections. People are talking about, yeah. you know, what, what could be in, you know, one thing that I that 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 I've been throwing out here as of late, and and just to just to put a curveball in the conversation, understanding that nil dollars typically it has been focused around you know your Instagram, your Twitter, your social media. What if just what if we wiped away all of the platforms? No, no blue checks, no social media, no followers. Then what do we do in regards to nil? No, it's great. I, I, and I prefer that. I think that's a really cool question to dive into. Uh, you see Instagram's already playing. Uh, they've got a beta testing going on of taking away likes on Instagram. So you can like a picture, but you'll never know how many likes you got. Um, or, or especially your followers will never see how many likes you got. Um, I think for the influencer marketing side, you'll still have to get in, your insights so, your, so companies can see the data on that. But um if you've got like a business account, but it's absolutely a good question. Like what, it, what is value if it's not likes and follows? Um, and you're always going to be wanting to calculate a return on investment. You're going to want to find what the business, what you bring back to the business after they invest in you. Um, but I, I really like the, that concept because like, I'm not an Instagram famous guy. Like I, I don't, I don't hold much value on Instagram. Um, but I still think I hold a lot of value as a person. So it's about teaching those student athletes that you're more than likes and follows, which we've known that this has been an issue for a long time. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but that Instagram uh, tried starting Instagram for kids and it got shot down pretty quickly for 13. Because mm -hmm. right now you've got to be over 13 to be on Instagram. Um, and they were tried starting one for 13 and under. Um, Zuckerberg obviously hitting that and he got uh, questioned at the – uh, at a congressional hearing for it and he was saying oh you know we can bring a lot of value to to 13 and unders you know they can communicate with their friends and everything and these uh, congressmen and women are going what like go outside go hang bike around to your friends houses like that's yeah. it's how we used to do it so um i'm i'm definitely scared for what social media is going to continue to do because i don't i think our addiction is to um too ingrained to be able to break it easily i'm i'm definitely addicted to social media i'm not not gonna pretend um <laughs> so yeah it, it's it's a good question because we we as humans hold a lot of value that isn't based off our followers and our likes yeah 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 and i mean i, th I think that's where the identity even i know all this is gonna be a whole nother conversation but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna hold you too much longer tay but i like i I know so much, just like you, you, you know as well. Just coming from the student, student athlete welfare, you know, uh, just just in that position and wanting the best for the student athlete to be developed holistically. And I think this is the part where the identity is so prevalent. This is the part where uh, the community or their network is so necessary, just so that they're able to take a step back and say, "I'm not. My value isn't determined based off of Instagram." And then having other people in your circle, in your group, affirming that, mm -hmm. saying, yes, you know, you're, you know, one of the roles that you have is you're an athlete, but outside of that, you're a son, you're a daughter, you're this, you're that. So, you know, being able to, be, being able to focus on those things as well. And we don't just rely solely on follows, on likes, because that is, that, that's, that's very sticky. It's, it's, it's sticky. Sticky. Yeah, I mean, it's no one wants to end up in that in that uh, in that world. It's not a it's not a good place to be. We've seen too many studies come back on the the correlation between mental health and social media addiction, and so it, it's not a game we want to play. And it, it, quite frankly, as far as the NCAA is concerned, it's a game we're we're going to play. Um, I just hope that, like you said, those the biggest thing that you just said that's important is those around you affirming it. Um, and, and not being a catalyst and and that uh, the strengthening of that addiction. De definitely, de definitely, man. This 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 was good. This was good, Tay. This was this was good. This was good. 
But now, now I see, I see you take, taking your water, taking a water break. I'm good. I'm glad because we're about to get into the two minute drill. We're about to get into the two minute drill. And uh, for those of you this might be your first time watching or listening, uh, the two minute drill is where we're going to just do some rapid fire questions. We're going to have a little bit of fun. And then, Tay, I'm going to send you on your way. So are you ready? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. All right. And here we go. Favorite food? Sushi. What, what type of roll? uh shrimp tempura okay okay what what's the last book you read um i'm reading power 50 laws of power right now mm, that's a solid one that's a solid one what, what's the most underrated cereal uh oh honey bunches and oats you have to eat it quick yeah 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 yeah, eat it yeah, quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's your go-to streaming show of preference uh the office makes sense are you talking about the original or are you talking about the the american version the american version uh i grew up on the original though mm, wow. I, wow i think i think steve corral went and now did it though well ricky gervais is still the executive producer on the america i know t i'll get don't let me get carried away on this one but i think the american one's better <laughs> gotcha what what's what's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete you can take your time uh yeah i would and i i think there's a quote out there of me saying this before but um you i would say that your skills in college athletics is transferable to the workplace and that's the biggest thing that kids need to remember because in my field right now i've got student athletes that come up to me and go you know i've never had an internship or I've, i don't have any work experience how do i get a job and i'm like you've got you've just had four years of work experience and learning how to change what you've done as a college athlete because i will say the, the job of a college athlete is one of the hardest there is you as much as you think they get paid in scholarships and all that which is trust me it's very it is a, a nice wee kickback that kids get whether it's cost of attendance and new clothing and food and all that kind of stuff you do get a lot as a college athlete however uh, it's difficult you're on a very tight schedule you know you work very hard you learn to work with different people you have opportunities like SAC or community service events or student athlete development events but then on top of that, you have a whole athletic department waiting to serve you too. Like even if it's someone that doesn't work with student athletes, like if you're in digital or, or something that you're not always with the student athletes like I am, um, you, if a student athlete walked into digital and was like, hey, do you mind if I learn you know, what you're doing? Can I watch you? Can I shadow you for a day? None of them would say no. Like you have a whole an industry sitting there in your athletic building. And you, if you, you're like, oh, I don't have any experience in marketing. Well, we've got a whole marketing department. Go knock on the door. None of them. And I promise you, there's no no person that works in an athletic department would turn down teaching a student athlete about what they do day to day. And if they would, get out of the industry. Because at the end of the day, we all serve our student athletes, whether you're in the business office, to digital, to the medicine, to uh, ATs and external, we're all serving student athletes so my advice to student athletes use your time as a student athlete because it's all transferable you're learning a whole lot of skills but you've got all these resources that are all waiting like no they're not primed to come and find you and be like hey steve walking down the hall do you want to learn about marketing no they're not going to come find you you've got to go find them but it's all your resources are right at your fingertips. So when I get to my seniors coming in being like, I haven't done anything. It's like, firstly, why? Secondly, uh, you kind of have, you just need to kind of lean into it more. So um, that'll be my advice to student athletes is be aware of the resource, be aware of the resources and be proud of your four years. You, you, there's a lot of transferable skills to the workplace. Excellent, excellent. And then who would you like to see me interview next on Beyond the Ball? Oh, I love this question because uh, there's and, and immediately I'm thinking like all the famous people that I want to hear from. Um, but the uh, in in our industry, there's so many special people in college athletics that I think are really cool. Um, I would say Ron Moses is a, a an incredible um, a, a leader when it comes to diversity and inclusion which i think is an incredibly important conversation so dr ron moses would be a, an excellent excellent pick um tim bryson i think you you know tim bryson from maryland um i think uh, there's something i saw you both like something so um tim's really cool too what tim's doing in the international student athlete space um is really special to uh to me as an international student athlete and him being an american 
um, and let alone an African American that uh, you know has a lot of um, systemic issues that African Americans could be fighting their own battles right now. He chooses to step away and fight for internationals who have a lot of issues, whether it just be regulations or getting used to living in America and their own various forms of racism, um, depending on what countries they come from. And, and Tim's really fighting for the international student athlete, which means a lot um, to have an advocate that isn't an international student athlete. So um, I thought that was really cool. So the, I, I won't. I could make you a list, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna cap and say, Dr. Ron Moses and and Tim Bryce. Soon, uh, soon, Dr. Tim Bryson. He's not. A oh doctor. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. This, this, this is true. This is true. Well, Tay, I, I appreciate you taking the time to to hang out and, and and share with the ballers as well as myself. Now, please just take a take a moment and let let everybody know where they can find you, how they can follow you, and uh, get connected with you. Yeah, so uh, I would say for me on Instagram, my Instagram is a very casual place. Um, there's not a whole lot of business that goes on there. But if you want to check out more about my life, Tay.Hawker on Instagram. And then Twitter, uh, if you're interested. And in, I keep it pretty sports business on Twitter. And uh, my handle there is just at Tay Hawker without the period in between. So uh, if you want to find me on either of the, I suppose TikTok too, if there's student athletes watching, it's just at Hawker, just my last name. Um, if you want to go follow on, on TikTok, but that my TikToks have catered to student athletes. So I wouldn't be upset if, uh, if professionals didn't go follow. <laughs> Oh man, fair enough, fair enough. Well, Tay, th thank you uh, once again just for, for gracing us with, with your presence and sharing your story and, and, and just all of your wisdom and your insight. And uh, man, look, looking forward to continuing to stay connected. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it a ton, man. I, I love what you're doing here. Keep it up. Definitely. Thank you. All the ballers, all the ballers out there, if you have not taken the time to follow Tay, make sure you follow him, like you said, on Instagram at Tay.Hawker or on Twitter at Tay Hawker, or on TikTok at Hawker. So I, I would encourage you all def definitely to follow him because uh, he, he's doing some innovative things, especially with the, the tidbits on NIL, which I think is really beneficial and really necessary. But until next time, if you have not subscribed, if you have not followed the podcast, I would encourage you to do that on YouTube. Subscribe, 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 and then leave a rate and review on Apple because that helps us to move up to the top and also just continue to spread the message and the awareness of Beyond the Ball. And I'm Jonathan Jones. This is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree.